Welcome to the latest edition of Circling the Bases. I'm DJ Short, and I'm joined here once again by Scott Pianowski from Yahoo. We're live on Twitch, so welcome to our audience there. And if you're listening in podcast form or watching later on YouTube, we're recording Wednesday afternoon. Apparently some guy wants to play for the Jets. I don't know. It's kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> World Baseball Classic going on. Spring training action continues. But uh, we're actually going to take a step away from the headlines today and talk about players we are fading this spring. And I'll bring you in here, Scott. What is your definition of a fade? Yeah, I, the idea when I do a fade column is to give players probably in the top 100 who I think I'm going to be underweight on, who I'm unlikely to draft at their current market value. And, and it usually comes down to that. These are the players on my list are all good players. I, I have a guy who won an MVP last year is on my fade list. Um, but if sometimes if, if I were to tell you, oh, don't draft this player who's going 255 in Yahoo leagues, what, what would that how does that help you? You know, you can figure that out for yourself or, or don't draft this guy who's, you know, who's going to have Tommy John surgery. You, you, you don't need help yeah. with that. I'm going to at the end of the day, DJ, before the season starts, people want to know who we like and who we don't like, like and, and don't like you know, relative terms. You know, um, I would draft any of these players at the right price. I just don't expect to get them. So I'm just trying to give you an idea of when, when I'm at the draft table and these players come up at their perceived market value, am I picking them or not picking them? And these are going to be the guys I'm not picking. And and ultimately, this is always a, a little bit of a tenuous article or podcast to do, because if you get these guys wrong, you'll never hear mm. the end of it. And again, yeah. I, I, there's a lot of we, we're, we're naming a lot of star power on our list. Mm -hmm. We're we not ducking the assignment, but. You know, we're just trying to give an, people an idea how we play and how we perceive the market and uh, giving out fades as part of that. Yeah, I think it's super easy from like the analyst role to talk about sleepers, like late round guys, list of guys you like. But talking about the players you maybe aren't so hot on makes it a little harder. I, I Like you were saying, I don't know if it's people are afraid of being wrong or or what it is, but. You know, to me, the, the players that I'm going to talk about today are players that when I'm actually in a draft room this spring, I haven't drafted. And there is a reason for that. There's an instinct with that. And I'm telling you who those players are today. Right. Again, because the the opportunity lost is more significant when you get these guys wrong. It's, it's why a lot of times when people do sleeper and bus columns, it's like, here's a million sleepers. Here's a bottomless cup of sleepers. It's like a hundred sleepers. And here's like three bus. Right. You know, I mean, I'm exaggerating, but sometimes that's the way the industry plays this because it's, it's really easy to get in on the sleepers. And if you miss on a $1 player, nobody's going to hold your feet to the fire, you know, right. but if, if we get these wrong, you know, man, we're going to hear about it. But you know, again, we're not ducking the assignment. And at the end of the day, you know, we're not doing our jobs. If people don't, if people, if they've listened to this podcast with you and I this spring, they should have an idea of the players we like and don't like. And, and, I, and I get yeah. it. It's, it's a little bit frustrating at times that I know people in my leagues and surely people in your leagues will listen to these pods and they'll take advantage of us. They'll abuse us <laughs> for giving our opinions out so clearly. But again, this is the job we've chosen. You know, it's, um, it beats working for a living, right? It beats having a living, so. <laughs> That's um, uh, that's the truth. Let's give that's the people the what they want. Let's tell them all these great players that we don't want to draft. <laughs> all right. Sounds good. Before we get into that, a uh, quick word for our listeners and viewers. New MLB season, new rules, new stars. So pair it with the Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. Get all the player profiles, rankings, and projections you need to hit your draft out of the park. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com slash draft guide and use Pennant25. That's our special code. To save 25% at checkout. Again, that's Pennant25 to get 25% off. So definitely check it out. We'll have it updated uh, throughout the rest of spring training to reflect injuries, everything that's going on. Uh, you know, we saw yesterday the Cubs, it looks like they're going to start the year of, you know, co closers, uh, uh, Boxberger and uh, Fulmer there in Chicago. So anything going on will be on top of it. Freddie Freeman left the game yesterday with a hamstring issue in the world baseball classic for uh team canada hopefully not a big deal but of course we'll be on top of that too uh, but I, okay like i said at the top we're gonna take a step back from the headlines and, and get into these uh these fades not an easy topic but we are gonna come out swinging and I'll, i will give you the first cut scott yeah i'm gonna take a guy <clears throat> who's going in the first round of nfbc drafts 
Probably more of a second round pick in Yahoo leagues where I might be actually amenable to taking him. Bobby Witt Jr., though, I have not drafted him yet. Look, pedigree to the moon. He was a really good 21 year old last year. He, he ran, he hit for power. But his game is not fully developed yet. 290 OBP. And that Kansas City lineup, I mean, there's like four good hitters in it, and the rest of it is just depressing. And this is a common theme with some of my early fades is I, when you draft somebody in the first or second round, I want a player who's surrounded by what I call buoyancy. I, I want him to have other good offensive players around him. We, we will have a couple of those, but the Kansas city lineup is not a destination lineup. It's one of the 10 worst offenses in baseball. It might be a bottom five offense. And also when I looked at the projections are just something to consider. They are not mandates. They're not, you know, an answer key. But I noticed that the projection for Bobby Witt is almost the same as Randy Arozarena. Now, different player, different position, different part of his career arc. I get it. But they're expected to do almost the same identical thing by the spreadsheets. And you can get a Arozarena two or three rounds later. I, I don't know. Bobby Witt, because he's exciting, because he has so much pedigree, I think people want to draft and price in the improvement that you know, Bobby Witt's going to be a superstar. Bobby Witt might be an MVP someday. And I don't like pricing in that much improvement into a player's ADP. To me, he's like a late second round pick. Again, maybe in Yahoo, you can get him more affordably. When I see him going in the first round of NFBC drafts, I think that's fancy play syndrome. I mean, you see him going over Mookie bets sometimes. I will never play that way. Yeah, I, I'll get into a player later who I see in a similar vein. I, I think with Wit, though, I, I think I slightly agree on Wit, on Wit and slightly disagree. Where I disagree is the stolen base upside. So, you know, 30 stolen bases in 37 attempts last year. You got to figure, you know, with the rule changes that maybe he sees a little jump there. His his sprint speed is, you know, tops in the game Absurd. right up there with, with Corbin Carroll. So we know the Royals like to run. So at the end of the year, I think when it's all said and done, maybe he doesn't justify, you know, top 15 status. But I think the steals might give him enough of a floor where he'll finish the year as a top 50 player just in counting stats alone. And there's always the chance for a little bit more. Uh, so, uh, you know, speed, position, all that kind of stuff, I think, plays into it. Again, I would not drop him as a first rounder, but I think even if you do, like, you're probably going to be okay and he's probably not going to make or break your season. Yeah, I guess my takeaway here is that. I'm not taking him in the first round. If you can get, and again, he's a second round pick in a lot of Yahoo leagues. I'm okay with that. Qualifies yeah. at both shortstop and third base. We often talk about how much we like players who do that. And third base is not particularly, it's so weird. I mean, when I first started playing fantasy baseball, none of the shortstops could hit. Now all of the shortstops hit. <laughs> and that shortstop might be the easiest position to fill. I get the idea a lot of managers yes. who select wit are going to be using him at third base. Yeah. So if you, anybody out there who's a pro wit guy, you want to take him in the second round, I'm fine with it. I, my, strongest part of this takeaway is just i don't think he's a first round player yeah so the the player i was talking about who i see in a similar vein is michael harris the second uh so his adp on nfbc since march 1st is 27.83 so we're talking about a second round player in in most leagues right in that randy Arena area ahead of luis robert ahead of jose altuve and marcus Semien at, at a weak position outfield like we talked about um, pretty much all draft season is is top heavy. I, I think it's sort of deceptive in that we think there's so many outfielders, there's such a big pool of players that you can find quality later. But to me, I, I feel like midway through draft, I'm like, man, I don't, I'm not sure about a lot of these guys. I think we are hungry for that next like five category monster. And yes, Michael Harris could be that eventually. I'm just not sure he's ready right now uh i think the plate discipline uh leaves something to be desired he had a walk rate of 4.8 percent last year he had a ground ball rate last year of 56.2 percent which is in christian christian yelich range and we know how much his power has been up and down all over the place throughout his career he also struggled against the left-handers last season hit 238 with a 649 ops against southpaws so we haven't really heard a lot about that at a strikeout rate of 30.4%. I think there's a floor here that's nice. Like, he's going to have some good counting stats. He'll probably finish in the top 80 players because of that stolen base upside. But I'm not sure he justifies this pick. I think it's pricing in improvement that we're not sure is possible yet. 
yeah, Harris was better last year than the, even the Braves expected. Then, of course, he signed that extension, buying out <clears throat> his arbitration years. It's funny, you mentioned Yelich as a ground ball guy. And when you said that, out of nowhere in the back of my mind, I just felt a little twitch. And I thought of another former Atlanta Braves outfielder who could do a lot of different things, who came up very early in his 20s, who had a ground ball profile that was Jason Hayward. Yeah, and we know how Hayward's career's gone. Now he's trying to hold on, and I think he's, he's in Dodgers camp. I want to say, mm-hmm. but um, obviously he never really justified that contract with Chicago. They did win a ring. That flag flies forever. Jason Hayward seems like a decent guy, but when I think of Jason Hayward, I think of him grounding out the second base. Yeah, yeah. just four to three. Uh, yeah, Harris is an easy fade for me. I, I feel like he outkicked his skills last year and production. And, and again, this is like you know, people see wit. Like, oh, he was great last year. He'll be better this year. Harris, he was yep. really good last year. He'll be better this year. Production uh, uh, improvement, player um, careers are not always linear. Sometimes players take a step back. Now that league has seen these guys, the pitchers will adjust. The players will have to adjust to the adjustment. There's no guarantee that anybody who was good as a rookie has to be as good or better in their second year. And when the yep. ADP bakes in the improvement, as you talked about with Harris, I think it's an easy fade for me. Yep. Who you got next, Scott? Okay. Uh, you know, uh, really good player. A guy I would welcome on my fantasy team. A guy I welcome on my favorite real-life team, which is the Boston Red Sox. It was frustrating to watch Mookie Betts go out the door. It was frustrating to watch Xander Bogarts go out the door. They did keep Raphael Devers. That's great. They got Fenway Park, which is a monster offensive park. It's not really a home run park, but there's no foul territory. Great batting eye. It's a great place for offense. Unfortunately, Raphael Devers does not have a lot of talented teammates around him. This is the worst Boston Red Sox offense I can remember in 10 or 15 years. You've said that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel like I say that every show. So I, I apologize. But it's, <laughs> and here's, I'll give you a very specific inflection point with Devers. because I feel like this happens every draft that I'm in. He goes pretty much next to Pete Alonso in just about every draft I'm in. Or I'm in a salary cap draft. Mm-hmm. And they're about the same price. Yep. And with Pete Alonso, they're both great players. Their, their shapes are a little different. You would think Devers would hit for a higher average. You would think Alonso would have more home runs. But Devers has to deal with his Boston lineup, which has holes all over it. And the Mets lineup, one to nine, is, is loaded. In fact, the Mets have so many good hitters. They have really – we've talked about we talked about some of them on Monday. They have really interesting offensive pieces who may not make the team or may not be in the mm-hmm. opening day lineup where the mm-hmm. Red Sox are just like – they're dying to get anybody who can hit. And I see three or four guys that I like. So – in the first few rounds, you need to draft. I use the fantasy football example. You wouldn't draft a fantasy football running back in the first or second round who was on like a three-win team. You'd be like, oh, my God, his team's going to be horrible. I'm worried about that. That's going to hold him down. Fantasy baseball is much the same way. You need to be supported by your teammates. I don't think Devers is going to be as such. Not that he'll be fine. He's a really good player. He's at a good point in his career arc. But if you're telling me Pete Alonso and Raphael Devers are both on the board, I'm going to take Pete Alonso every time. So even if my fade is more of a make sure you take Alonso before Devers, even if that's as, as little you're going to take out of this as possible, I'm happy with that. I want you to draft into the good offenses. The Red Sox are not a good offense. So usually when you're in that second, early second round, mid-second round area, all those third basemen are in the same spot. And I'm including Bobby Witt Jr. in this. Manny Machado, Austin Riley. To me, Devers would be last in that list. I wonder, after what you just said about Wit, would you do Devers over Wit? Because Wit has the stolen base upside, yeah. I'd have to lean Wit. Hmm. Again, he, he, I mean, he could steal fifty bases, and, and I don't think anybody yeah. would bat an eyelash. Right? Yeah, that's interesting. You know, um, but yeah, to me, Devers would be last among those four players as well. It's I would not definitely, it's no definitely dis- take Riley and Machado over <clears> him. I wouldn't even hesitate. Yeah. Yeah, and it's no disrespect to Devers. He's a fantastic player. But the supporting <laughs> cast, like you said, the supporting cast uh, matters uh, for counting stats, and that's certainly true. Uh, next up for me is Andres Jimenez, uh, who really broke out last year. He was kind of out of nowhere, hit 297, had 17 home runs, had an 837 OPS, uh, 20 stolen bases, 69 RBI, 66 runs scored, just really uh Great counting stats. I think he finished sixth in the MVP balloting. Uh, he was fantastic. But there are a lot of things where you're looking, especially if you go to Baseball Savant, you look at that page and you're like, how did this happen? Because Jimenez's uh, XBA, expected batting average, was 257. So you have a 40-point 40, 40, uh, 40 difference there between his batting average and his expected batting average. And the reason why is, I mean, Jimenez just does not hit the ball very hard. 
He just does it. 29th percentile in average exit velocity, 36th percentile in hard hit percentage, 33rd in barrel percentage. The speed is very good. And I, I think there is still a bit more upside there in the stolen base department, especially given the environment that we expect to be in this year. But I wouldn't be shocked if he loses a few homers, the batting average comes down. And then at that point, he's kind of a little bit more pedestrian uh, second base option in, in a, a time where second base is kind of weak. But ADP for Jimenez right now, 79.11. That's since March 1st. A couple of rounds before Glaber Torres, who kind of similar profile here. A few rounds ahead of guys like Max Muncy and Jorge Polanco. You could wait a really long time, get Brandon Lau, Jonathan India, bounce back guys we talked about. A useful player across the board in Tyro Estrada with the Giants almost 100 picks later. I just don't think you have to reach for Jimenez early. Yeah, you hit on a lot of things that I will echo. We can find interesting players who might be overpriced by their savant page, and my next guy is going to fall into that line. And and also with Jimenez, you know, he had a surprising year last year. Now it's baked into his ADP. And you can find similar players who are priced several rounds later. And yep. you're listing a lot of guys I'm drafting into, like like um, Jonathan India is a guy I like. Uh, Strada, a position grabber. He's probably going to bat lead off every day for the Giants. You're, you're getting similar players who go four, five, six rounds later. I, Jimenez is somebody I'm not going to draft. And you, you talked about his stat cast profile. That gets me to my next fade, which is Paul Goldschmidt. And much like Devers, he's one of my favorite players. And when Goldie won the MVP last year, I think he probably got in the inside track of a Hall of Fame career, and I'm excited about that because I, I, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think Nolan Arenado on that same team at third base is a Hall of Famer. But Goldschmidt ran very lucky with his expected stats. His batting average was like 60, about 50, 60 points higher than it yeah. should have been. His slugging percentage was almost 100 points higher. So that that's not the way to bet year over year. He could easily have a similar type of season, and maybe hit 280 instead of 317. Maybe slug like 460 instead of something a lot higher. And he's into the age 35 season. He'll go in the second round of a lot of drafts. He won't get out of the third round. I just think he's priced a round or a round and a half too high off the MVP season, off a season where his baseball card stats were much better than his metrics suggest they should have been. That stuff, Bill James talked about the plexiglass principle. That stuff generally tends to, to bounce back towards the mean the, the following year. It's not that... It's not that he'll be unlucky this year. It's that he'll probably have regular luck this year, like most players yeah. have, somewhere close to their baseline. <clears throat> so you don't, you generally don't want to pay the freight when a player has an outlier season. Paul Goldschmidt, year over year, is just a very consistent player. If you draft him, you're going to get a good guy. You're going to get like 275, 27 homers, 92 RBIs. I just don't chase what he did last year because there's a lot of luck baked into his end of year stats. I I agree, and you know I've done mock drafts, you know, well in the double digits. Uh, actual drafts, I'm approaching double digits right now. I have a problem. Uh, but <laughs> when I'm when I'm in these drafts, I've yet to draft Goldschmidt once. I, I thought about it in one of my leagues that was an OBP league. That was a little bit of a separator with guys like Alonzo and Olsen. But in kind of more as a standard five by five, I'm more intrigued by the power upside of Alonzo and Olsen, who are basically in the same area. And then there's a tier drop off. You could wait for uh, Jose Abreu going to the Astros, which we love. We've talked about that, and get a much better value there. I'm also enticed with what with what uh, Vinny Pasquantino could offer. I know you're a little uh, lower on him than me, but I just see other avenues than paying for someone who won an MVP in his age 34 season. I also I see in a lot of the drafts. Also, Olson might be a half round to a round cheaper than Goldsmith. <laughs> And with Olsen yep. being one of those players, I know we've beaten this to the ground, but he's going to be a guy who gains batting average points from the shift being outlawed. Mm -hmm. I, and I think <clears throat> Olsen probably had about as bad a season as he could have had last year. We yeah. talk a lot about the danger of when players change teams, when players change leagues, and one of my fades will come under that heading in a minute. But uh, another reason why I'm not drafting Goldschmidt is I'd really like to get Matt Olsen maybe a round later. Yeah, and I've said this before. I think I said it on our, our draft show. If I could do a futures bet on MLB home run leader, it would be Matt Olson. I, I'm, I'm just all in on him. He's been a bit up and down in his career. So maybe this is, we'll go in the every other year strategy with Matt Olson uh, to lead the league in homers this year. He's certainly capable of it. 
so next up for me, I have Dylan Cease. Uh, I know some people might not like me for this, uh, but ADP since March 1st, 50.83. Same range as Max Scherzer, Shane Bieber, Christian Javier, Zach Wheeler, Julio Urias, Luis Castillo, all really, really quality names. And Dylan Cease, I guess, deserves to be in this kind of stratosphere, uh, coming off a 2.20 ERA last season, 227 strikeouts. But there's there's always the risk there with Cease. So led the AL with 78 walks last season. That's been his bugaboo over the years. Uh, the XERA for Cease last year sat at 3.50. Uh, almost a, a, a run and a half higher than his actual mm-hmm. ERA. And, you know, he had a 319, 391 ERA in 2021, 4.01 in 2020. And if you remember Cease last year, yes, he was great. And I don't want to like discount what he did, but there was this stretch. I think it was right in the middle of the season when I think he gave up like one or two runs, earned runs over the case of, uh, over the course of like 14, 15 starts which is like, that's a, that's like once in a lifetime, you know? Meanwhile, like the White Sox uh, defense was so bad that there were a number of uh, unearned runs in those starts. He still gave up those runs, but it didn't reflect in his ERA. That White Sox defense is not changing either. Mm-hmm. And Eloy Jimenez might actually be out in the outfield this year as well, which I don't think any pitcher necessarily wants that. I think it's you're going to get the strikeouts. That's that's great. You know, you want that certainly, but I think the CRA is going to float back up in that mid threes range this season. Yeah, I, I'm with you on Cease. Um, again, baseball savant or Fangrass will point to you how lucky he was last year. He's got a control problem, and he's such a popular player in the marketplace. I feel like he goes a round or two earlier that I'm willing to draft him. There actually is a team I'm drafting a lot into, but I'd rather take the values of a Lance Lynn or a Lucas Giolito. Yeah. Than Dylan C. So um, we're, we're very much in lockstep. We talked earlier about the dangers of a player sometimes, big contract, changing teams, changing leagues. This is a, a tenet of a strategy that Rick Wolf and Glenn Colton have used. They, they don't like players the first year and in, in off that big contract, new team. And so Xander Bogarts leaves Fenway Park, leaves the Red Sox. And Bogarts is generally somebody who gets a lot of value from his batting average. He's not that big a category juice guy anymore. I mean, last year yep. with 15 home runs and eight steals. That, that's nice. Yep. That will not distinguish you in the shortstop pool. There's so many players who will at least meet that, if not beat it. Now, now Bogarts may have a higher average, but his stats always had a Fenway Park tilt to them. Sometimes yep. players just do better at home because, look, it's their own bed. It's home cooking, whatever it is. But we talked about how great everybody knows Fenway Park is a great park for offense. Petco Park is no longer Death Valley for offense, but it's more of a neutral park. I get it. The Padres have a deeper lineup, and Bogarts will enjoy that. But who's to say how he'll react to just the changes in his life, new place to live, new league, pressure maybe to validate the contract. And because shortstop is so deep, it's not even that I I dislike Bogarts or maybe where he's going. It's just that you should love the shortstop value you get because there's so many options. You cannot lose at this position, you're going to find a shortstop. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm getting the deal that I'm getting. So don't talk yourself into somebody. I'm yep. going to make Xander Bogarts have the adjustment year, the gap year in San Diego before I welcome him back into my fantasy good graces. I'm, I'm just worried where that category category juice is. He's in the middle of his career now, <clears throat> a time where the stolen bases could maybe disappear at any point. I think he's a little bit mispriced. I, I don't like him. Just too many things are, are pointing the wrong way for him into 23. You know, as you were talking about the counting stats for Xander Bogarts, I was thinking about Nico Horner uh, with the Cubs, who I think you can get, you know, five rounds later. Mm -hmm. And I think when it's all said and done this season, their counting stats and maybe even their batting average will be very, very similar. It's kind of scary. Like, legitimately, they could have very similar numbers. Uh, So, yeah, I think you're right. And shortstop, you can afford to wait, too. So I, I think you can wait into the 100s. You can even get like an Ahmed Rosario. He's not going to get on a base, get on base a ton. But again, he can give you maybe definitely more stolen bases, similar power to Bogarts as well. So I don't think you have to stretch that early. Horner will also qualify at second base during the season. Yep. 
and uh, and Yahoo pick it up after five games. So, and this could maybe even be another podcast. You know, the idea of getting the generic versus the name brand. Mm-hmm. Maybe Xander Bogarts is a name brand, and, and Nico Horner is a generic. Horner also is an outstanding defensive player. So, yep. if people look at him and say, "Well, am I sure the Cubs are going to play him?" I think his glove keeps him in the lineup. Rosario, yep. as you mentioned, is also somebody who will qualify at multiple positions. Yeah, and Horner is expected to lead off for the Cubs this season. So you get the volume at the top of the lineup, which could be better than a lot of people think, especially when Seiya Suzuki returns. So up next for me is Jacob deGrom, another player switching teams during the offseason. Uh, his average draft position uh, since March. Sorry, I have a live draft going on. It just went off. See, so yeah, I have a problem, like I said. Uh, so <laughs> my average draft position or the average draft position for DeGrom is 35.15, sixth among starting pitchers, right in the same range as Spencer Strider, Sandy Alcantara, just ahead of Aaron Nola, Brandon Woodruff, uh, Shane McClanahan, guys like that. So this doesn't require much in the way of explanation why I'm fading Jacob DeGrom. Uh, yeah, apparently over the side issue he had earlier on in Rangers camp, he threw In a minor league game on Monday and all was well, 24 pitches, no issues, all signs are he'll be ready for the season. But how much can you reasonably expect from Jacob deGrom? He could very well throw throw 150 elite innings, but to me, he's just as likely to throw 50 innings spread over the course of six months while causing constant anxiety to his fantasy manager And to me, like I said, I've been in so many drafts, mock drafts, regular drafts. When I'm in that spot and I'm like, man, Alcantara, Nola, Woodruff, I'm like, I don't have to have those headaches with those other guys. Yes, pitching is inherently a risky athletic act. It just is. Like, pitchers get hurt. But DeGrom, we know he's been hurt. Mm -hmm. We know he throws harder than, like, any human should. Uh, The risk is just inherent there. Totally agree. When we were exchanging our lists offline, I, I actually didn't realize that you'd listed DeGrom. DeGrom was initially on my list, so I mean, yep. I'm just going to co-sign pretty much everything you said. When you draft DeGrom, you're signing up for six months of anxiety. I used to make the joke, and I, I say this tongue-in-cheek because I want everybody to be healthy. I don't, nobody yeah, takes pro- it takes joy in an injury. But we used to joke about Steven Strasburg being Stressburg because every mm-hmm. little – Every time he'd, he'd flinch, you'd be like, oh, no, did he blow out his shoulder? Did he blow out his elbow? Yep. Is something wrong with his forearm? And DeGrom's like that. And just because every pitcher has risk does not mean the risk is even. And yep. DeGrom, after the last two seasons, I, I, I thought, you know, if we were talking, if we were doing a podcast in November and, like, anticipating ADPs, I'd be like, yeah, yeah I'm curious to see how the market handles DeGrom. What would it be, like a fifth-round pick, a sixth-round pick? I'm shocked his ADP is where it is, where people are drafting him like there's really nothing major to worry about. Yeah. Uh, man, don't do not do it to yourself. Don't don't stress yourself out. And now it's a much more difficult call with my last pick because he's a lot, a lot of the DeGrom issues are going to come into play with Tyler Glass now, who, who goes several rounds later. But yep. remember – one season past 90 innings. I think he's never gotten to 120 innings in a career, and he's still a top 100 pick. There's a time when your draft should shift all to upside, where you play with your hair on fire. I, I'm playing for first place. I don't care if I come in last. I, I get it. You want to be a daredevil. But Glass now goes a few rounds before I'm ready to flip that, flip that switch to I'm just going to play with my hair on fire. The fact that he's never had a fully healthy season, at least to Grom, he's won Cy Young Awards. Tyler yeah. Glasnow has never really been eligible for anything because he never gets through the full season. And you know, he's he's a really big guy. Was he like six foot eight? There's a lot of moving parts there. I'm really surprised that people are as aggressive on Glasnow as they have been. He's going two or three rounds before I'm ready to even consider him. Yeah, and you know, with the oblique issue right now, uh, he's yet to resume throwing. He's already hurt. He's already yeah. hurt. Right. And so he'll be back for may- maybe by the end of April. You know, we'll really see. But why buy into that? You know, already when we know he's sidelined, setbacks always possible. Obliques are tricky. Uh, to me, it's just not wor- worth getting into unless he slips incredibly far in a draft. Which, if you're in a certain room with a certain group of people, uh, that might be appealing at some point. And um, I don't know about you, Scott, but sometimes I like to leave a draft with an injured player because um, it gives you that basically a free roster spot. Uh, to pick someone up off off waivers and you're essentially stashing a player early in the season. 
I don't have a problem with that. And also, you know, some formats in a head to head format, maybe where it's like, okay, if glass now is healthy during my fantasy playoffs, it's not going to hurt me as long as I think I'm going to make the playoffs anyway, it's not going to hurt me to carry him. He also, you would have to draft him for me, for my taste personally, it would have to be a league that had some IL flexibility. Like I would not yeah. take him in like the TGFBI in the NFBC formats that don't have IL right. slots. You're right. just playing a man down. Well, and again, he's already hurt. I always say that, you know, injuries are going to find you. You don't have to go looking for injuries. And in the case of class now, it's not a matter of when he's hurt. He's hurt right now. So that's, um, there is a time and a place to take a player like that. And you, you have to, uh, uh, everything we give out, all the opinions, all the ranks, you have to season it to the attitudes and slants of your league. Every league drafts differently. There's different sophistication levels. So there's a certain type of league structure that maybe glass would be interesting to me or maybe even to ground for that matter. But in the leagues I run in, they've been priced much out of my comfort range. So a uh, quick reminder here uh, to our listeners to download the Roto world app to receive breaking player news all season long injuries. Uh, <laughs> you may have to track uh, with some of these pictures we just talked about. Stay ahead of your competition by favoring players on your roster. Uh, get the latest player news and much more delivered right to your phone available in your app store today so the final player for before, me before you give your final player yeah. i just want to say i say this all the time i'm going to say it again you have to have that app because information it's going to save you time and it's going to get you to the front of the line for those you know those quick pickups you need to make you yeah nothing's more important than that you know you need to know that the the closer just got hurt in one city and who's going to take over or a yep. hot player got called up or something like that and, for, and it's just it's going to save you time and you're going to make better decisions so um unless you're in my leagues you know <laughs> i don't want you i don't want you to have information i want you to go play with your kids and you know, go go to europe <laughs> forget about your team for three weeks but uh it's information's the most important thing you can have in fantasy yeah that, that, I, that app will make you a better player and I, you know, especially in leagues where, you know, the Yahoo friends and family league that we do, if you are in a league where it's just mass chaos on the wafer wire and you can do daily moves, like you gotta be, you gotta be ready. If you're, if you're sleeping a little bit or you're, you know, off the grid for a couple of hours, like you might, you might miss something. So, you know, I'll give you another cheat code in addition to the Roto world app. One of my favorite cheat codes. Now you have to find the right person. But if you can, if you share a worldview in fantasy baseball with somebody who's a buddy of yours, and you co-manage the team, now you have one. You have somebody who's interested in your team. They'll they'll talk about it with you. And when you're off at your child's play or you're on a business trip, they they can handle the, the work. They can handle the yeah. fat bids. They can handle the roster setting. And in my um, longtime keeper league, I uh, doing great. You know things were things were going well, and I got a little bit burned out in the mid two thousands, and trading which i used to really enjoy was starting to frustrate me with, with like the low mm -hmm. ball offers and you know i don't want to send 20 emails back and forth so i partnered up with my buddy scott gleason who's a lawyer who loves negotiating <laughs> who loves trading to me the player evaluation is the fun stuff but i don't really and you know the fab i kind of enjoy i don't enjoy the trading part of it he'll go 20 rounds with anybody so i do the player eval he does all the trading and it's we've been really successful as a partnership. I talked about Colton and the Wolfman earlier. They've been a yeah, very successful. They're partnership. very good. You need to have somebody who has a similar amount of acumen as you do. If, if you're the shark, and the other person's a casual player. Maybe it won't work, but I've seen some really good partnerships. And if you're God, if you're in like a first come first serve league, it, it's so advantageous because you just get so much more coverage. It's not yeah. feasible. It's not really realistic to be online 24 seven. You, I yeah. want you to have a life. I want you to sleep. I want you to see your <laughs> wife or your girlfriend or your kids, you know, all this stuff, your dog, you know, so uh, a cheat, a great cheat code. If you can find the right partner is to buddy up with somebody. Yeah. It's a, it's a good fail safe. It's a good safety net. If one of you is offline, uh, that's a, that's a good recommendation for sure. I, I could use, I could use a wig man or woman, uh, with my teams. You and, <laughs> Shelly, you and Shelly should partner up. You'd be a great yeah. team. Yeah. You know, I've thought about that. That would actually be fun to do one year, especially since we're both, you know, here at Roto World. Uh, we did a write up actually of our Tout Wars experience where we are competing against each other in Tout Wars. You can go to NBCSportsEdge.com uh, to check it out. It has round by round uh, breakdown of all of our selections, uh, our favorite picks from the draft as a whole, and what we thought of each other's team. So 
Uh, it should be fun to go head to head with Shelly in that. My last pick, uh, Nick Castellanos. So he's outside the top 100 right now, 115.69 uh, since March 1st on NFBC. So, uh, you know, you're not investing an early round pick. However, he's right in that like second outfielder mix with like Taylor Ward, Jake McCarthy, Christian Yelich, who we mentioned earlier, Chris Bryant, Stephen Kwan, Anthony San- Santander. And you look at what Cassianos did last year, hit 263, 13 homers, 62 RBIs, 694 OPS. Very disappointing numbers in a year where we had big expectations. I think there were concerns about him leaving Cincinnati, but then to sign with the Phillies, great park for offense. That's the reputation. A lineup that on paper was very good, but he just fell off the table with really his worst numbers in a full season in his career. And the, and the thing is, the, the scary thing is that it was mostly earned. Uh, Castellanos has been a guy who has generally hit the ball hard in his career consistently, but that didn't happen last year. Suddenly, he was in the 22nd percentile in average exit velocity, 23rd percentile in hard hit percentage, 39th percentile in barrel percentage. Strikeout rate was up. Swung more often than ever before. Highest chase rate of his career. And I'm just left sitting here like wondering why. Like, was it signing in Philadelphia? That kind of fishbowl. Everyone's looking at you. You have the media on you. You get off to a slow start. It all snowballs. Like, I don't know. Was he pressing? Um, It's really hard to answer. But it's not one of those things where it's like, yeah, you know, he hit the ball hard and he was unlucky. Like, I think this ADP is sort of pricing in uh, this dead cat bounce, which is what some people call it. And I'm not sure it's going to be there. Like, I don't see the evidence from last year that it's just automatically going to happen. Yeah, he missed about four weeks of time. Do you remember if he had an injury or was that just load management? Or Because I, I, I'm like you. I'm trying to explain why this happened. Yeah. Yeah, I, off the top of my head, I cannot remember. No, I don't but... remember. I don't remember a major injury because you know when somebody has a season like this, a, a Nick Castellanos, a name brand, a player, the type of player. I think most of the years we've drafted this guy, you feel like okay, I got a nice solid building block, not an MVP candidate, but like a nice second outfielder. Maybe you stole him as your third outfielder. You feel really good about that. And last year, I was actually really patient with Castellanos on some teams, and it hurt me. It, I paid for that. Because he hit for a mediocre average, he hit like thirteen home runs. I, you know, he was a, a a lost player for anybody who had him in fantasy. And at some point, you know, uh, aging curves. I mean, I'd be really nervous. He was in his mid thirties. I think it's an age thirty one season for him. But I'm I'm hesitant to get back on that on that um, bike. I don't know. I, he makes me nervous. I don't. I wish I had more clarity to this because I feel like we're yeah. kind of driving a little bit blind by it. But uh, he makes me nervous too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I remember, certainly in September, there was something with his toe. There was like a turf toe thing. I think there might have also been an oblique issue, but how does that explain what happened earlier in the season? I'm not I'm not quite clear on that. So maybe, it's, maybe it was just dinged up. Maybe it was partially dinged up, pressing with a new contract. It's really hard to say. Yeah, I, I haven't drafted him yet, although – I, I'm willing to be open-minded that maybe I'm wrong on all this, and maybe we'll be like, oh, yeah, of course Nick Castellanos went back to being like 290, 25, 95 Nick. It could happen. It's a good lineup, um, especially when they get Harper back. But by the way, speaking of Harper, um, didn't show up on either one of our lists. I'm curious how you're playing Bryce Harper with him expected to miss such a chunk of the season. We talked about Glass now, who's already hurt. You know, There's a certain t- there's a time and a place you take a guy like Glass now. Yeah. How are you playing Bryce Harper in your draft so far? So... I actually said in my Tot Wars write-up that Bryce Harper was my favorite pick in the entire oh, draft. Wow. I missed that. Okay. Uh, so the reason for that is it's an OBP league. So last year, Harper was playing with his compromised, although I think he had a 370 uh, OBP, which is still good. I think it was 367. The two previous years, he was well over 400. So to get that player, to get Harper, uh, I think it was like pick 140 or something like that. In an OBP format, I was like, I was waiting for him to come back around because I was going to take him in a league like that, where you have unlimited IL spots, like that's just a gimme. Like you should just go for it, especially that deep in a draft for me. It's just, I feel like every league I've been in where I want to take him, he goes like a few picks before me where I'm like, okay, this is the time 
you take a shot on a, you know, third, it's basically you're in second or third outfielder territory and in many mixed leagues. And you're at a point where it's like, hey, why not? But I do think it's going to vary from league to league, uh, how aggressive, how risky certain managers are willing to be. But I, I, like I said, outfield is top heavy as it is. I think it gets a lot easier to take that risk at, at, at a certain point. But as we've also discussed over the course of the spring here, it's like you're hoping come July that you're even relevant at that time. You're going to be waiting a while. You talk about outfield being top heavy. That's another reason why with a lot of my early picks, like if I'm top of the first round and maybe Aaron Judge and Trey Turner are on my board, I will lean towards Judge because I feel like it's going to be harder to fill the outfield spot yeah. later where I'm never, I never feel pinched at shortstop. We, we talk a lot about how you can just do well at any price point. So yep. if you're, if you're between a couple of players in the first round, second round, third round, I think leaning outfielder actually might be your, in your best interests. Yeah. And, and when I recently did NL only labor, I did end up with Trey Turner as like my big ticket item. And if I had a do over, maybe I would have done it a tiny bit, differently i'm still happy with trey turner i'm sure he'll be fine but i think applying that those dollars to the outfield would have made my roster a lot easier to fill out but we'll see how it goes you know i want to also say before we close up shop that you in passing you mentioned the cubs going with a committee and you made me happy mentioning michael fulmer because in, in tgfbi i did not go after saves i i was the least saved drafting manager in the league, but I did take a late flyer on Fulmer. And I mean, if he even got 10 saves, I would be over the moon. So um, from, from your you know lips to, to God's ears, let's uh, I don't know how many wins the Cubs are going to get. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to see Michael Fulmer be in the ninth inning mix. I think it has a good shot of happening. I've taken a shot on him uh, in a couple of drafts so far in hopes that um, that's how it emerges. There's a lot of options there in Chicago. So that's going to be, one of those we're going to have to follow, I have a feeling, uh, throughout the season for sure. Thanks a lot, Scott. We will be back uh, next Monday to record another episode of this show. And make sure you subscribe to Circling the Bases wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, be sure to rate and review if you like what you're hearing. Also, make sure to follow us on Twitter if you don't already. Scott is at Scott underscore Pianowski on Twitter. I'm at DJ Short. Take care, everyone. We will see you next time.